Hi everyone. In today's session, we're going to be talking about the cardiac cycle. So before we do that, we need to remind ourselves of the structure of the heart. Okay, so we need to be able to label the structure of the heart. And this is a really beautiful diagram of a cross section through the human heart that enables us to see all of the key areas. So let's just start over here with the superior vena cava. And we can see how it's the superior vena cava where blood flows back to the heart, deoxygenated blood flows back to the heart from any areas of the body above the heart. And then here you've got the inferior vena cava where deoxygenated blood flows back to the heart from all the places in the body below the heart. So these join up, you can't see it on this diagram, but if you imagine round the back, they join up to form one blood vessel and then they enter the right atrium here. That's what this bit is there. Okay, so they enter the right atrium and so blood, deoxygenated blood flows into the right atrium. Deoxygenated blood then flows from the right atrium so here we can see cavity of the right atrium, down into the right ventricle. So this area here is the right ventricle. In order for the blood to travel from the right atrium into the right ventricle, it has to go through the right atrioventricular valve or the AV valve. So the AV valve separates the atria from the ventricle. And you can see it here, okay? So it's sort of rather nicely shown on this diagram can see the AV valve here. So the AV valve, we know all valves, they prevent backflow. So they open when the right atrium is contracting and pushing blood down into the right ventricle. And then they snap shut when the right atrium is relaxing to prevent a backflow of blood back into the right atrium from the right ventricle. The other thing you can see on this diagram, which is really lovely, is you can see these tendons holding the right H, uh, the atrioventricular valve in place. And you can see that on this side as well. You can see the tendons holding the valve in place. So, oh, and the other thing to probably note here in this diagram is the cardiac muscle. So you've got the cardiac muscle that makes up the wall of the heart. And you can see on the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, the cardiac muscle wall is thin so you've got this thin cardiac muscle wall making up the outer edge and it's still thin all the way down here this is because the force that it needs to generate through contraction is not very great so when the muscular the cardiac muscular wall of the right ventricle contracts it forces blood through and let's just have a look back here it forces blood through up here and through into the left pulmonary artery via the semilunar valves and then the pulmonary artery the left pulmonary artery can you see how it splits you can't quite see it because it's around the back but you have to imagine that this is starts off as one vessel and it splits into two the left and the right pulmonary artery and these both head off to the lungs the left lungs and the right lungs where they'll take the deoxygenated blood to be oxygenated but that's really close. Like think about where your heart is, think about where your lungs are, they're right next to each other. So it's not gonna take a huge amount of contractile force to get that blood there. So we have this thinner wall here on the right side in comparison to the left side. And that's really obvious in this diagram. So let's just take a minute to look at the semilunar valves. The reason that they're called semilunar valves is that they look like half moons, semilunar. Again, the semilunar valves, like all valves in your body, they prevent backflow. So when your right ventricle is contracting and the blood is being forced up and out of the heart into the pulmonary artery, the semilunar valves open to allow the flow of blood. But when the right ventricle relaxes, they snap shut to prevent the back, backflow of the blood. So blood is always traveling down pressure gradients and that pressure gradient is being generated by the contraction of the ventricle. So when the ventricle is contracted, there's a higher pressure in the ventricle than there is in the pulmonary artery and so blood flows in that direction. But when the right ventricle relaxes, there's now a higher pressure in the pulmonary artery in comparison to the right ventricle and so blood would naturally flow backwards and that's why the valve needs to snap shut. So the blood goes off to the lungs to be oxygenated. So just a couple of extra things I want to point out to you here. So this section of muscle that separates the left and si uh, sorry the left and right side of the heart is called the septum. 
So we've got this septum here. Sometimes when you hear about uh, children being born with a hole in the heart, it's here that the hole is. So you can have uh, two different types of septal or septum defects. One where there's a hole between the ventricles, mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, and one where there's a hole between the two atria, although that's quite hard to visualize on this diagram just because the way it's laid out, but the atria are next to each other, just round the back, you kind of have to imagine it. So you can have the two ventricles mixing blood if you had a hole in the heart, or the two atria mixing blood if there was a hole in the heart. So in general, your arteries carry oxygenated blood and your veins carry deoxygenated blood. Your pulmonary artery is an exception to this. The pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And the other exception we'll get to in a minute is the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood back to the heart. But in general, if you're trying to remember like, oh, what's the job of arteries? What's the job of veins? Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood towards the heart. So the blood goes to the lungs, becomes oxygenated, and then it's going to travel back to the heart. When it travels back to the heart, it comes via the pulmonary veins. So we can see the pulmonary veins here, and they're going to fuse into one vessel just around the back, you can't see it. And you can also see on the other side, the right pulmonary veins, and they travel around the back, just have to use your imagination a bit, and then they fuse and they all enter the left atrium. So the oxygenated blood enters the left atrium. When the left atrium contracts, blood is forced via the left AV valve, which you can see here, the left AV valve, into the left ventricle. When the atrium contracts, the left AV valve is open and blood flows through, down its pressure gradient. Then, when the atria relaxes, the AV valve snaps shut to prevent backflow. So now the blood is in the left ventricle of the heart and then the left ventricle contracts. As the left ventricle contracts, the blood is forced up through this semilunar valve here, up, but you have to imagine it's behind here, into the aorta. So this is the aorta. This bit here is the aortic arch, just because it looks like an arch. And then the aorta branches into a series of smaller arteries. These smaller arteries feed the head, the torso, and then the pelvis and the lower part of your body. You also have a branch that you can't kind of see that's sort of down here that branches off into coronary arteries. You also can't really see it on this diagram, but we'll look at it on the next diagram. But the coronary arteries then wrap themselves around the heart and feed the heart muscle with oxygenated blood. And this is really important so the heart has access to oxygen and the heart can continue to beat. So that pretty much covers everything that we need to know about the structure of the heart and also the flow of blood through the heart. Just a couple of other key terms that we'll be talking about quite a lot, but might as well introduce you to them now. When the heart contracts, we call this systole, and when it relaxes, we call it diastole. So atrial systole is when the atria are contracting, and atrial diastole is when the atria are relaxing. Ventricular systole is when the ventricles are contracting, and ventricular diastole is when the ventricles are relaxing, okay? And we know that the atria contract in unison, and then the ventricles contract in unison. So let's just take a minute to have a look at this diagram for a second. This diagram is showing us all exactly the same things as we saw before, except now you can see the heart closed off, so it hasn't been cut open. So there's a couple of things that we can see on here that we couldn't on the other one. And the first here is the coronary artery that I was mentioning that was right down at the bottom of the aortic arch. And you can see how the coronary artery then starts to branch all the way around the cardiac muscle to feed the cardiac muscle with oxygen and nutrients and to take away wastes. And equally, you can see the coronary veins just in blue performing you know, their function of taking away carbon dioxide and other wastes from the cardiac muscle. Um, what else can you see on here? You can sort of see a slightly better image. This is quite nice, actually. You can see how the pulmonary artery is one vessel here and then it starts to split off and diverge into the um, left and right 
vessels. Okay, so let's talk through the cardiac cycle. The atria contract in unison. When the atria contract, the AV valves open. There is now a pressure gradient where there is a higher pressure in the atria in comparison to the ventricles. And there is a, so there's a lower pressure here and there is a pressure gradient. So blood flows down its pressure gradient into the ventricles. So you have atrial contraction, atrial systole. During this time, you can see that the semilunar valves are closed. Once atrial systole is finished, we enter atrial diastole. And we then enter, there is a brief gap. And then the ventricles contract. The ventricles contract from the bottom up. So the electrical signal that tells the ventricles to contract is carried down the septum and then travels up the cardiac muscle from the apex of the heart. So contraction starts here at the base and then travels up. So it's an upward contraction. When the ventricles contract, there is a pressure gradient between the ventricles and the pulmonary artery and the ventricles and the aorta. At this po point, the semilunar valves open and blood flows out of the ventricles. During this time, the AV valves snap shut to prevent a backflow into the atria. When the ventricles enter diastole, they relax, their volume increases, the pressure decreases. The semilunar valve snaps shut. At first, the AV valves are also shut until the point where the pressure is lower in the ventricles in comparison to the atria, at which point the AV valves open and you get passive filling of the ventricles and blood just flows from the atria down into the ventricles. Then we have atrial systole and the atria contract. So we have active filling of the ventricles from the atria. So during the passive and active filling, the AV valves are open and the semilunar valves are closed. So I want us to spend a minute studying this graph. So the graph shows us a bunch of important information. So here we can see at the top, so this is from the left side, but even though the numbers of the pressure measured in kilopascals and the volume might be a bit different because of the differing sizes of the the, sorry, the different thickness of the cardiac muscle in the walls, um, essentially the shapes would be the same. So this is essentially the same for the left and the right. It's just you get a greater increase and decrease in the left because it's slightly bigger and it has thicker muscular walls. So this focuses on the, this top line here is the left atrium, bottom line is the left ventricle. So this is showing when the left atrium is contracting. Uh, and so that's this part of the graph. And we can also see that when the left atrium is contracting, the left ventricle is relaxing. Makes sense, right? So there is a pressure gradient from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And then we can see that the left atrium is relaxing and the left ventricle is contracting. So here we're in ventricular systole. And this final part of the graph, they are both relaxing. So it's during this final part of the graph that we will have um, passive filling of the left ventricle from the left atrium. And this stage is known as diastole or diastole. So this graph might look a little bit confusing, but actually it makes total sense. It's just talking us through how the volume of the ventricle is changing and the pressure of the ventricle is changing at different points. And when that links to the valves opening and then we've got a few different bits of information we've got the ventricular pressure the atrial pressure the ventricular volume and the aortic pressure so let's just talk about each one in turn
So during the contraction of the left atrium, we can see that the volume of the left ventricle is increasing. That makes sense. Blood is entering the left ventricle from the left atrium. The other key thing here is that we need to understand that the there has to be a pressure gradient and that's exactly what we see here. This pink line here, the atrial pressure, and this yellow line here is the uh, ventricular pressure. So here the atrial pressure is higher than the ventricular pressure. So the blood is moving down its pressure gradient into the ventricle. And here we can see um, this pink line is the aortic pressure. The aortic pressure is, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a huge drop, but it's dropping a tiny bit. There's no blood flowing into the aorta during this time. And notice, can you see it says here that a aortic pressure is always high. Um, An aortic pressure is always high because of the elasticity of its walls. So when, um, when there is a pulse, when blood flows through, there is stretch in the elastic tissue, so it widens. And the widening of the lumen of the aorta when blood flows in stops a huge increase in pressure in the aorta because now you've got a larger volume for this larger volume of blood that's entering you've now got a larger area of the lumen of the aorta and then when there's no blood flowing in the recoil of that elastic tissue reduces the area of the lumen preventing the pressure from dropping too low so that's a really important here we've got this recoil action okay so first of all the atria is contracting you've got this pressure gradient and then when the left ventricle contracts, as you would expect, the ventricular pressure rises. And at the point when the ventricular pressure goes higher than the atrial pressure, so at this point here, and it's really important that we notice this on the graph, so at this point where the ventricular pressure is higher than the atrial pressure, this is when the AV valve closes to prevent backflow. And just as expected, the ventricular volume drops when contraction occurs. And just as we would expect, blood flows from the ventricle into the aorta. And this is important here. Can you see how the ventricular pressure is higher than the aortic pressure so there's a pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta so blood is flowing from the left ventricle into the aorta okay so that's what's happening here if we just think about what's going on in the um, left atrium we can see that the pressure in the left atrium is dropping because there's no contraction okay so can you see also here it says the atrial pressure is always relatively low because of the thin walls of the atrium cannot create much force it's highest when they're contracting contracting but it drops when the left atrioventricular valve closes and its walls relax. During this time the atria are filling with blood. This leads to a gradual buildup of pressure which is what you're seeing here in this line. This is the gradual buildup of pressure due to the filling of blood from the vena cava. So we can see here we're coming to the end of the ventricular contraction. As the ventricle stops contracting, the moment that the aortic pressure rises higher than the ventricular pressure, the semilunar valve has to close to prevent backflow. And then you get a drop in pressure, drop in pressure, drop in pressure, drop in pressure. And as soon as the drop in pressure goes below the atrial pressure, the AV valve opens and you start to get passive filling. You get passive filling because there is a pressure gradient. The atrial pressure is higher than the ventricular pressure. So you get passive filling of the ventricle from the atria and so the volume of the ventricle starts to increase. So take a look here. So the ventricular volume rises as the atria contract and the ventricles fill with blood. So that's earlier on. And then it drops suddenly, which is this middle part of the graph as the blood is forced out into the aorta when the semilunar valve opens. And then the volume increases again as the ventricles passively fill with blood from the atria. So that's what this graph is showing. So I know it might look like a lot, but actually it makes total sense. And it's just talking you through the process of the cardiac cycle. So it's important that you understand why the volume changes in the ventricle, 
and why the pressure changes in all three of these areas and how those pressure changes affect the valves. When are the valves opening? When are they closing? Why are they opening there? Why are they closing there? And it's all about the pressure gradients. So when we think about the cardiac cycle, it's really important that we can visualize this process. Okay, so we've got blood flowing from the atria to the ventricles and then blood flowing out of the ventricles into the blood vessels. When we listen to our heartbeat, we hear these two sounds. Those two sounds are the slamming shut of the valves to prevent backflow. So in this video, we've talked about the structure of the heart. We've talked about the flow of blood through the heart. We've talked about the reason blood flows, so jack down its pressure gradient. We've talked about when the valves open and close and why they open and close and the volumetric and pressure changes in the different chambers of the heart. So it's really important that you take some time to digest this and understand why each part is happening. But well done for listening today and I will speak to you soon.